Hi, everyone. We're at the top of the hour, so we're going to get started today with our very exciting webinar on cardiac protection by the leptin brain melanocortin system in heart failure with our presenter, Dr. Andrew, uh, Dr. Alexander De Silva from University of Mississippi Medical Center. My name is Dr. Christina Asa, and I'm from Fujifilm Visual Sponics, and I'll be moderating today's session. I'd like to point out just a few housekeeping notes about today's webinar. A recording will be made available after our live session today. So if any of your colleagues were not able to attend, we can, uh, they will be able to view the webinar on our website uh, later on. All your lines are muted for the duration of the webinar, but we do encourage you to please use the Q&A button at the bottom of your Zoom panel to ask any questions throughout the presentation, as we will have a question session at the end of our presentation. We expect the presentation to be about 25 minutes in duration, leaving us five or 10 minutes for questions. A few notes about our presenter today, Dr. De Silva obtained his PhD in Brazil, studying the impact of salt consumption during pregnancy on the renin-angiotensin system and blood pressure regulation of the offspring at adulthood. For postdoctoral training, he moved to, to Jackson, Mississippi to study the importance of the brain mel melanocortin-4 receptors, or MC4R, in contributing to leptin's anorexic and cardiovascular actions. Soon afterwards, he joined the faculty of University of Mississippi Medical Center. His research began to focus more on the role of the leptin brain MC4R axis on glucose regulation in type 1 diabetes. He observed that leptin restores all the cardiovascular alterations associated with uncontrolled diabetes. He has now shifted his research to focus on a series of experiments to test whether activation of the brain leptin MC4R axis protects the heart against cardiac dysfunction in animals with myocardial infarct. So without any further ado, I'd like to pass things over to Dr. De Silva. Uh, can you all see me now and hear me? Yeah, I can see your screen okay, now. Wonderful. So, um, so good morning again or good afternoon. I don't know where our participants are. And it, it's a pleasure to present this uh, webinar. Thank, thank you, Mandy, and thank you, Christina, for the kind invitation to show our recent work and also for the audience to, for their interest in to watch our presentation today. So what I'll discuss with you in the next uh, 20, 25 minutes or so is to show you that leptin has powerful central nervous system actions that can improve heart function and protect against cardiac uh, failure in, in after myocardial infarction. And then I'll briefly discuss the importance of the brain melanocortin system, particularly melanocortin-4 receptor as a key mediator of these uh, brain effects of leptin. And then briefly go into some of the cardiac alterations that are evoked by activation of the brain melanocortin-4 axis that we think contributes to the improvement in, in heart function and the protection against the progressive heart failure that would normally occur in our model. And in the last couple minutes of this presentation, I also would like to share with the audience some of our personal observations on 4D echocardiography and how it may be superior compared to standard echocardiography when evaluating cardiac function in situations where the heart does not move uh, normally, such as occurs in, in myocardial infarction. So to begin this presentation, I think uh, everybody already know that heart disease is the leading cause of death, not only in the United States, but almost everywhere in the world. And a significant portion of this high mortality and high morbidity from heart disease comes from coronary artery disease, including uh, myocardial infarction, which may eventually progress to congestive heart failure, which has a very poor survival rate for these patients. And unfortunately, current therapies are not very effective in protecting these patients. Therefore, there's a urgent need for novel and more effective therapies to 
treat these patients and improve their, their care condition so they can live longer and have a better lifestyle. So thinking about that, we thought that leptin, which is a peptide hormone produced by fat cells in proportion to the degree of adiposity, which is mostly known for its powerful effect to regulate food intake and body weight homeostasis. For example, animals that do not produce leptin or that have defective leptin receptors present tremendous uh, increase in appetite, reduced energy expenditure, and early onset morbid obesity, which is also seen in humans with rare mutations of leptin or leptin receptors. In recent years, there has been uh, what I would say like a controversy on the role of leptin in, in, in cardiac function in heart failure. For example, it has been suggested that high leptin levels in obesity may be detrimental to the heart by promoting cardiac inflammation and fibrosis. However, these studies could not uh, investigate the effects of leptin separately from other detrimental effects of obesity that may confound, that may have confounded these studies. On the other hand, data from our laboratories and from others have shown that leptin through its effects on the central nervous system have powerful effects that may be good for the heart, including in increasing insulin sensitivity, as well as in fatty acid metabolism and glucose metabolism by peripheral tissues, which includes the heart. Therefore, our hypothesis that activation of leptin receptors in the central nervous system actually may be our friend in the heart failure and improve cardiac function in situations of metabolic stress, such as occurs after myocardial infarction. So begin, to begin testing this hypothesis, we instrumented spread dollar rats with an uh, intracellular ventricular cannula. And after a week of recovery from the surgeries, we performed uh, baseline measurements, including cardiac evaluation using the Vivo 3100 system, which I'll talk more about at the end of this presentation. And soon after getting these baseline measurements, we induced myocardial infarction with a permanent ligation of the left descending coronary artery. And we followed these animals for four weeks. And in, the, in the half of the animals, we treated with saline, uh, given directly ICV, or with leptin at a very low dose that did not cause significant increase in circulating leptin levels. And we performed serial echocardiographic evaluations up to four weeks post uh, MI. And as expected, in the animals that were treated with vehicle, the MI was associated with progressive heart failure. As you can see, there is a marked reduction in the ejection fraction in the vehicle treated animals, but that did not occur in the leptin treated animals. So beginning on the week two of treatment, but being significant on weeks three and four, we can see that leptin protected against this progressive heart failure and improved cardiac function, including completely normalization of cardiac output, which we did not see in the vehicle treated animals. We also observed a complete normalization of left ventricle uh, radio strain, which is another index of left, left ventricle systolic function. And ICV leptin treatment also completely prevented cardiac congestion, as indicated by the lack of an increase in the left in the size of the left atrium uh, compared to the size of the aorta. Perhaps this can be uh, better visualized in this um, example. This is the same animal before MI. On the first week of the MI, and you can see that he had a large uh, infarction here on the anterior wall. And here on week three of treatment with leptin, where you can see that the MI continues there, so the anterior wall is still akinetic, but there is a marked improvement in the contraction in the other areas that are healthy and uh, were not affected by the infarct. This can also be seen uh, on a short axis view of the same animal, so baseline and uh, on week one, as you can see, and on week three, where we, we can clearly see that the areas away from the infarct can contract much better when the animals are treated with leptin ICV. 
And this was corroborated by other uh, results, including uh, reduced heart weight and lung weight in the treated animals, and the fact that the animals that were treated with leptin continue to have the same exercise capacity in, on a treadmill at week four post MI compared to baseline, which was not the case in the saline treated animals, where there is a marked reduction in their capability to, to, of performance, exercise performance after the myocardial infarction. We then uh, ask the question, what are the brain mechanisms that mediated this uh, action of leptin? And one obvious candidate to us was the brain melanocortin system. We've previously shown that activation of the brain melanocortin system is very important and key for leptin to reduce appetite, regulate sympathetic activity and blood pressure, as well as glucose homeostasis. So briefly, uh, leptin crosses the blood-brain barrier, activates pro melanocortin neurons, mainly in the arcuate weight nucleus of the hypothalamus, but perhaps also in the brainstem, which then releases alpha melanocortin stimulate hormone, which is the endogenous agonist of melanocortin for receptor in uh, key nuclei in the hypothalamus. There's also a significant amount of MC4 receptors in the brainstem. And then that would lead to the effects of leptin that I described before. For example, for the glucose homeostasis, we previously shown that intracellular ventricular infusions of leptin completely normalize glycemic levels in type 1 diabetic animals. And this can be completely uh, blocked by co-infusion of a melanocortin 4 receptor antagonist, in this case, SH29119. We have also shown that melanocortin 4 deficient rats do not respond to this anti-diabetic effects of leptin. So then we ask the question, does melanocortin-4 receptors also contribute to the effects of leptin to improve cardiac function? So to do that, we employ the same uh, experimental design, but this time we infuse leptin in melanocortin-4 deficient rats. And we also infuse the MT2, which is a synthetic agonist of melanocortin-4 receptors in Sprague Dolly rats. And we also follow these animals for four weeks after the MI. And what we've observed is that infusion of leptin in melanocortin-4 deficient animals did not improve cardiac function post-MI, whereas activation of melanocortin-4 receptors with the synthetic agonist MT2 recapitulated the improvement in cardiac function that we observed with leptin. And here I'm showing you uh, cardiac output, which is uh, recovered almost all the way back to baseline. Also, uh, marked improvement in the ejection fraction, the prevention of cardiac congestion by uh, attenuation of the, the enlargement of the left atrium with melanocortin 4 activation, and also a marked increase in the left ventricle radial strain with melanocortin 4 receptor activation. So these studies suggest to us that the brain melanocortin system, and particularly melanocortin 4 receptor, are key in mediating this beneficial effects of leptin in heart failure. We then uh, looked at the heart of what could be potential mechanisms in the heart itself that could help explain how activation of the brain melanocortin system and well, how leptin and activation of the brain melanocortin system could be improving cardiac function in heart failure. So one of the first things we looked at is phosphorylation of AMPK and PGC-1 alpha levels, because these factors are important regulators of cellular metabolism and are also involved in the modulation of mitochondrial biogenesis. So what we see is that two weeks after treatment with leptin, ICV leptin, we see uh, significant increases in phosphorylation of AMPK, as well as higher PGC-1 alpha levels. We then uh, began to examine mitochondrial function. And at first on an electron microscopy, it suggested to us that 
ICV leptin treatment increases mitochondrial number in the in the cardiomyocytes, which was corroborated by uh, when we measure mitochondrial DNA expression. So COX3 and ND4, which are mitochondrial genes, are significantly elevated in leptin treated animals. And we also measured oxygen. Um, Sorry, we also measured a mitochondria function using uh, the Ouroboros uh, system. And we found that ATP linked respiration corrected by O2 consumption is also improved in animals that receive either leptin or melanoportin 4 receptor agonist MT2, suggesting that activation of the brain leptin melanocortin system not only uh, improves the number of mitochondria, increases the mitochondrial number, but also improves mitochondrial efficiency. So overall, could explain this marked improvement in cardiac function in heart failure. We also measured uh, substrate oxidation uh, in these animals. So at two weeks of uh, treatment, we removed the hearts and put them in a working heart preparation. So these are uh, ex vivo perfused hearts. And what we can see is that ICV leptin treatment, treatment markedly increased glucose oxidation by these hearts. And this increase was of almost uh, doubling compared to vehicle treatment. And it also had a positive effect on fatty acid metabolism. Not shown here are uh, recent results with AMT2, which caused an even more pronounced effect on fatty acid metabolism by the heart. We also uh, performed measurements of uh, isolated cardiomyocyte contractility. And what we also observed is that associated with this improvement in cardiomyocyte metabolism, there was ultimately an increase in cardiomyocyte contractility. For example, sarcomere shortening was markedly increased by leptin or MD2 treatment, as well as sarcomere shortening velocity as you can see here in the compiled data, as well as in a representative tracing of sarcomere uh, behavior. So overall, our working hypothesis that leptin works in the brain, activates its receptor, then triggering activation of the brain melanocortin system, particularly melanocortin-4 receptor, which uh, we are in, in certain key areas of the brain, which are now pursuing, and uh, we hypothesize that melanocortin-4 receptors in the paraventricular nucleus of the hypothalamus, as well as in the brainstem, dorsal motor nucleus of the vagus, the nucleus of the tractus solitarius, and in the intermedial lateral medulla, which are, which ex exhibit high density of melanocortin-4 receptors, may be key in mediating these uh, actions of leptin, and we are currently pursuing this now but then activation of this leptin melanocortin axis then would lead to cardiac mitochondrial biogenesis, an improvement in substrate utilization, both in glucose and fatty acid, leading then to better ATP production and energy uh, substrate availability for the cardiomyocytes. In the non-infarcted area, this is important to note, then leading to improved cardiomyocyte contractility in the no infarcted area of the heart, which then leads to what we've been observed, which is preserved cardiac function in this model of heart failure. So now on the last uh, three slides, I would like to discuss with you the potential superiority of 4D echocardiography versus standard B mode uh, that we've been uh, recently performing with the Vivo 30, 3100 system. And uh, although I've not been paid to advertise um, by Visiosonics, but this 3100 system is very user-friendly and we have used the 770 system, the 2100 system, and we are now using the 3100 system. So anyone can learn in, within a day or how to use most of the uh, capabilities of that machine. And one of the capabilities of the 3100 system is to perform this 3D evaluation of 
heart uh, function. So we you can see the heart moving in a 3D uh, fashion over a certain period of time. <clears throat> and our preliminary data so far suggests that in normal shaped hearts, so these are baseline values, there is basically no much difference if you compare uh, standard B mode, and in this case, we use LV tracing with 4D mode. So basically don't see any difference in the ejection fraction, cardiac output, or in diastolic volume. However, when the heart is misshapen, as we've been observed in this model of myocardial infarction, so for example, the anterior wall does not move as expected, <clears throat> then it appears that the B mode may overestimate the, the, how would I say, the deterioration of heart function, I would say. So what we've seen is that comparing the B mode with the 4D mode, there is actually an, a better uh, ejection fraction, cardiac output, and lower end diastolic volume in animals with heart failure. So we have not yet uh, distinguished if in our, if our treatment, we see different difference with our treatment, but overall, if the heart is, if the shape of the heart is altered, perhaps 4D uh, mode will be superior to B mode. And that to our opinion is because in a normally shaped heart, so this is at baseline of a, a striped dolly rat, you can see that the heart contract as a whole, so from top to bottom and from left to right and right to left. As you can see here in this uh, representative uh, movie, as you can see the heart contracts normally and has its normal uh, ejection fraction, etc. However, in the animal with myocardial infarction, as you can see here on the right, you can see that there is uh, reduced contraction from top to bottom because here on where I'm pointing here on the anterior wall, it doesn't move as expected. However, the the contraction from left to right and right to left are are normal because these areas are not affected by the infarct. And this and this movement here is probably underestimated when we do uh, B mode with uh, LV tracing. So with uh, 4D um, analysis, we can then uh, evaluate all the movements of the chamber here in the left ventricle. Whereas when we're doing B mode, then we probably overestimate the change in cardiac function because we are, you know, measuring, putting the tracing exactly where we see um, most of the damage in the in the left ventricle. So with that, I'd like to thank uh, my collaborators for this project uh, here from, from our department, as well as the financial support for not only the studies, but that fin finances our group from NIH mostly, and, and the, all the colleagues here in the Department of Physiology, and I'll be more than glad to answer any questions that uh, the audience may have. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. De Silva. That was a, a really great presentation and uh, a good explanation of some very well thought out experiments and uh, some great images too. So I, I'd like to take a chance to remind everyone to please use your Q&A buttons at the bottom of your Zoom panel if you'd like to ask Dr. De Silva any questions at all. So we have a couple of questions that have come in already. So Audrey's from University of Bristol said, excellent talk. What is the natural source of leptin to activate the arcuate PVN NTS axis? And does the circulating leptin activate this pathway? Thank you. Uh, it'll be the blood, you know, coming from the adipose tissue. And yes, we believe leptin will have all, uh, would activate uh, both in the arcuate and in the, in the brainstem. So I think there are some studies testing the excess of left in the, in the brain stem, although I'm not too familiar with those, but in the airquake at least, it, it should uh, easily access. And uh, some of our previous studies on the anti-diabetic effects of leptin, we have given leptin peripherally and found the same effect. 
although when we give in the brain, the effect occurs, the action occurs faster. But uh, you can you could either give it peripherally or or uh, intercerebroventricularly as well. Great, thank you. So the next question is, why does the leptin have to get injected via ICV? Uh, would it not work with an IV injection, for instance? Uh, sorry, Christina, could you repeat for me? Sorry, uh, for the injection of leptin uh, in the, the first studies there, it was done with a brain injection or the ICV injection. Correct. Would it work at all with an IV injection or why not? Yes, I, uh, I didn't hear the IV at the end, my bad. Uh, yes, I believe so. We have not done those uh, experiments yet, although we are doing, um, we are using melanocortin for agonists given peripherally for, you know, uh, for trans, you know, to see the potential for translation of these studies. But uh, I would be confident that giving leptin IV would also work. Great, I think that uh, dovetails nicely into the next question. Are there any therapy regimens that are planned to influence this model and the parameters covered in this talk? Well, we, one of our bets for, you know, that may become uh, like a therapy would be activation of melanocortin for receptors because um, there is the, although we don't know yet if, uh, leptin will, 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 obese patients will develop leptin resistance to this cardiovascular beneficial effects of leptin. Uh, it has been observed in obese individuals that leptin's ability to reduce appetite may be compromised to some extent. Although, as I said, we don't know if the cardiac protective effects of leptin would also be compromised. It's something that needs to be tested. But there is strong data, especially coming out very recently, that melanocortin for agonists may, may not develop uh, resistance in obesity. So they may continue to work in obese individuals. And I say that because obesity is one of the leading causes of myocardial infarction and heart failure. So I think those would have uh, a more potential for for becoming a new therapeutic approach in this model. Okay, that's great. Uh, so changing gears a little bit, do you have any strain or diastolic data from this model? Uh, well, with strain, we do collect. So I have circumferential strain, I have uh, longitudinal strain and radio strain, although I didn't show because of uh, sake of time. And uh, in this model, I have not, collected a significant amount of diastolic data. But uh, one of our postdocs and uh, Dr. Anna Omoto, she is using the model of um, ischemia reperfusion, myocardial ischemia reperfusion, and she is collecting uh, all the parameters that we can in diastolic function as well. But so, uh, and I think she'll soon have um, uh, more data on that, but I cannot comment on it yet. Uh, but we, yes, we are also interested in uh, becoming more interested also as well in this model in what the effects of activation of the leptin brain melanocortin system may have on diastolic function as well. Great, thank you. So the next question, what was the myocardial infarction size in your animals and did leptin treatment affect the infarct size? Uh, leptin did not. Um, and that may be because it's a bias from us, because if we perform the infarction and then we begin treatment. So if later on we see that that animal had uh, an infarction size that was below 25%, we would discard the animal. So if there was any, any difference, let's say that leptin reduced the infarction size, we would know because we would have discarded this animal. So we, we only hear, compare the animals with similar or comparable infarct size between 30 to 35%. But what we are seeing with the ischemia reperfusion model is that yes, most of the animals on this ischemia reperfusion show reduced uh, collagen deposition and infarct size 
with uh, lab, ICV lab increasing. Great, uh, that's interesting. Maybe some uh, thoughts for future experiments as well there. Yeah. And uh, the next question, have you considered looking into other functional metrics such as oxygenation to evaluate the effects of leptin in both the infarct region and in the brain? Yes, uh, I think that would be a good idea. Uh, the oxygenation, I think we, we probably could do that with the echo as well, with micro bubbles. I'm not sure if uh, or not to see how it would be, how would it perfuse the tissue or if we have to use a different system, so. I can, I can step in there. Um, that's actually is possible with our laser X system. So right. if you paired your, your 3100 with mm -hmm. the photoacoustics, uh, that would be able to get you the oxygenation data. Well, we'll be glad to be glad to try it for free, Christine. <laughs> <laughs> I'll let you uh, work that out offline. Sure. Um, so the next question is, uh, how does the brain MCR4 activation would protect heart function after MI? Is it by increasing of SNS or decreasing PNS? Is there any other route by which MCR4 activation is playing a role um, other than regulating the, a, um, the ANS? Yeah, the autonomic nervous system. Yeah. yeah, so that's one of our hypotheses. So we are beginning new experiments now to test that. So one of the things we, we are doing or beginning to do is to block the sympathetic nervous system and see if that uh, would impair uh, these beneficial effects. I know this may seem a little bit paradoxical because there is this impression that increased sympathetic activity in heart failure is bad. Although you do need some increase in sympathetic activity to the heart, you know, to counterbalance the, the reduction in heart function that you see. So we, we are currently doing those studies. And there's also evidence that the melanocortin system can modulate the, the cholinergic anti-inflammatory pathway. So there, there may be some, uh, some contribution of that as well. Uh, and we, we also uh, look into that. Um, from our anti-diabetic studies that I only showed one slide, but we have very powerful and very strong data there as well there may be some circulating factor that are triggered by activation of the leptin uh, brain melanocortin system that may also contribute to an improvement in metabolic uh, energetics of most cells in the periphery, you know, including uh, liver, uh, skeletal muscle, and the heart. So uh, there may be a combination of both autonomic modulation as well as something circulating in the blood, like a neurohumor factor, which will, will also be investigated in, in the future. But that's a good, good point, and we, we don't have a, a definite answer yet how, how the effects are transmitted from the brain to, to the heart. Yeah, that's, that's an, an interesting query. Uh, so we are uh, running low on time, but we'll take one more question. Uh, however, if you have not had your question answered. Uh, we did ask Dr. De Silva, and he's more than welcome to um, answer any questions after uh, via uh, personal emails. So the last question is: Have you compared any of your 4D data, or have you started to uh, versus uh, gold standard like cardiac MRI? No, no, we have not done uh, yet uh, cardiac MRI, especially for small animals, but. Uh, would be glad to collaborate with anyone that have a um, uh, rodent MRI or an MRI capable of you know, measuring cardiac function in, in small rodents, rats and mice, so we can compare, but, uh, and see how, it, how, it, how they relate. But I, I think, I personally think, I think that uh, the 4D would be comparable, you know, almost as good as the MRI, so we'll see especially if you can get, you know, clear images. Yeah, and that's uh, what some of the first pioneering publications have shown, uh, a very high degree of correlation between cardiac MRI and uh, functional results from 4D scans. Okay, so I think that's uh, all the time we have for questions for today. So we just move on to the next slide. I just wanted to 
thank everyone for coming today and uh, invite you all to please keep checking back on our, um, on our website and sign up. Uh, we have a, a good lineup of webinars that will be announced in uh, the coming weeks. Uh, sorry, Dr. De Silva, if you could just advance the slide sure. one there. Yep, thank you. Uh, if you have any questions or if you uh, want to request any support or would like to find out more information about our products, please visit our website and fill out our web forms. And you can find us, of course, on all the social media channels. And uh, you can visit us virtually at many upcoming conferences. And you can check on that on our website as well. And if we just advance one more slide, I'll point out a good resource for anyone who's currently using our system. We do have a number of training videos available online through what, what's called our Learning Hub. So please check back with us uh, for access to those training videos. So once again, I want to thank Dr. De Silva so much for your excellent presentation and for fielding those uh, questions so well. If you do have any more questions, please reach out and we'll be sure to pass those along to Dr. De Silva. And thank you all for joining us today and I hope you all have a great day.